Welcome to this online gathering at St. Michael's Uniting Church in Melbourne. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome. We begin with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge that the land on which St. Michael stands is the sovereign and unceded country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present who have cared for this country since its creation. And we commit ourselves to working for a more just sharing of resources and power between the first and second peoples of Australia. And as we gather with people from around Australia and in other countries, I invite you to acknowledge the first people on whose land you live. A warm welcome to members and friends of St. Michael's and to our online community, and welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. I want to begin by speaking a little about what will happen next week, because next week, the doors of St. Michael's Church will open for a Sunday service. We were last able to gather in the church on Sunday the 11th of July, nearly four months ago. We are excited to welcome back our congregation but our delight is also tempered by the ongoing pandemic. The number of new cases each day remi remains dauntingly high and people, especially those who cannot and those who will not get vaccinated, are still getting sick, needing treatment in hospital. And sadly, each day people are dying, leaving grieving family and friends. We are only able to open the doors because 80% of Victorians have been vaccinated against COVID-19. We are beginning to achieve herd immunity, which will protect against serious illness and protect vulnerable people who cannot be vaccinated. We are opening under conditions determined by the state government that require people to be fully vaccinated and be prepared to check in and show their vaccination certificate or their medical exemption. To hold a service for more than 20 people, we must abide by this requirement. But we also believe that it is the right thing to do. People who cannot attend church under these circumstances, for whatever reason, continue to be valued members of our community. And I am grateful that we are able to continue to create online services each week. And I'm also grateful for the unconditional care and compassion offered by the St. Michael's community to members and friends. If you would like to return to in-person church next week, please be assured that we will be following protocols to keep everyone as safe as we possibly can. And despite all the challenges, seeing one another will indeed be cause for joy. Today is All Hallows Eve, Halloween, Tomorrow is All Saints, which is sometimes called All Hallows, and the following day is All Souls. In the many streams of the Christian tradition, the feast days of significant saints are celebrated throughout the year. This year at St. Michael's, we have marked the feasts of St. Mary Magdalene and of course, St. Michael. However, there are 10,000 saints that are recognized by the Catholic Church so a wash-up day for minor saints was instituted in the 9th century. All Souls on November 2nd is a day to remember those who have died, the faithful, but perhaps not quite saintly. Some of what is believed and practiced around this time is superstition, but as with many ancient traditions, there's also wisdom to be found in the old ways, in mystery and memory, in seeking meaning, and honouring the saints who have touched our lives. This is a time to recall the ones who have loved us into being, the ones whose memories we carry with us, who enabled us to know ourselves as beloved and blessed. With all the everyday saints who have shown God's love, we gather today. With all the everyday saints who have proclaimed the many names of the sacred, we gather today. With all the everyday saints who have followed the way of Jesus, we gather today. With all the everyday saints who have given of themselves, we gather today. 
with all the everyday saints, past and present, we gather today. The glorious diversity of earth springs from one creative source. We sing together womb of life and source of being. prayer of awareness for all saints, for those who walked with us, let us pray. We honour and name those who gathered before us. We give thanks for the story that shapes us as a people. For those who walked with us, this is a prayer. For those who have gone ahead, this is a blessing. For those who touched and tended us while they lived, this is a thanksgiving. For those who journey with us in the shadows of awareness, in the crevices of memory, in the landscape of dreams, this is a benediction. And we give thanks for Jesus who dreamed for Jesus who died, for Jesus whose dream of love and justice will never die. Let us pray together. Abba God in heaven, glory to you. Your rule of love renews the earth. In your name we take part in that renewal, helping and not harming, caring and not coercing. We pray that we might receive with thanks the bread we need, the money we need, the warmth we need. We pray that forgiveness and freedom flow through our lives. Teach us that in sharing life, we live life to the full. 
remind us that evil is real. Still, we are not afraid of it, but confident that love is stronger than hate, justice other than revenge, true peace, the work of your spirit. Amen. When we meet face to face in worship, we greet each other with words and signs of peace. We continue to practice this ritual, even when we are apart. As I share words of peace with you, I invite you to share peace with the members of your household if you live with others, and to share peace in your heart with the world around you. May the peace of divine presence be with you. Amen. Listen for words of faith in John chapter 11, verses 32 to 44. When Mary of Bethany came where Jesus was, she fell at his feet and said to him, If you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the other mourners as well, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He asked, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Come and see. And Jesus wept. So the people in the crowd began to remark, See how much he loved him? Others said, He made the blind person see. Could he have not prevented Lazarus from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, said to him, Rabbi, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up to it and said, Abba, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And Lazarus came out of the tomb, his hand and feet still bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go free. For the stories of Jesus and the beloved community, we give thanks. Celebrating the communion of saints past and present, let us sing together, give thanks for life.
The contemporary reading is a poem titled Liminal Space by Polly Castor. In this waiting place, we loiter, hover, on a tentative cusp, a threshold between the familiar and the unknown, with no possible retreat. The customary comfort zone is gone, and where the entrance ushers is not yet seen. Our new question, let alone its answer, still is ambiguous. We are in limbo. We can either hesitate or go forward. The gossamer veil of divine nearness flutters ever so lightly, breathing inseparably close as we step to embrace the unrevealed with trust. A shimmering opportunity for connection and listening and being led right on through. Lean into this portal. It is the doorstep to fruitful ground. For wisdom that was in the beginning, for wisdom that invites and inspires, for wisdom made known amongst us, we give thanks. May our eyes be open to see, our ears open to hear, and our hearts open to love. Why, I wonder, did the compilers of the ecumenical lectionary decide to assign the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead for All Saints Sunday? All Saints and All Souls are days for honouring and remembering the dead, so why tell a story about raising the dead back to life? But persevering with the lectionary, which is sometimes a worthwhile agony, I remembered Marcus Borg's instruction for engaging with troublesome texts. Borg insisted that there are two important questions that we must ask when trying to get to the heart of any Bible story. Why do you suppose they told this story? And why do you suppose they told this story in this particular way? Borg's questions are more illuminating than the strategy of 20th century liberal modernist interpreters who suggested that perhaps Lazarus wasn't really dead. It is true that 2,000 years ago, if a person's heart rate and breathing slowed down to the point that people thought they were dead, then they might have been buried before they had a chance to recover. But finding a reasonable explanation runs the risk of missing the point of the story of not understanding why it was told, or why it was told in this particular way. An outright rejection of the story of Lazarus raised from the dead because it contradicts science, also limits what it has to offer to our spiritual journeys as individuals and as a community. The New Testament scholar, John Dominic Crossan, believes that the stories in the gospels mimic the teaching style of Jesus. Jesus taught through parables. Parables are stories intended to open those who heard them, in this case the disciples and the crowd, to open them to the truth. Crossan points out that we don't ask the same questions of parables that we do of history. Nobody ever worries about whether or not the story of the Good Samaritan actually happened. It makes no difference whether it did or it didn't, because the story tells us something that is true about life. Crossan says the writers of the New Testament imitated Jesus' teaching style and taught their listeners the truth about Jesus using parables about Jesus. He gives the example of parables through the two different birth stories of Jesus found in Luke and Matthew. These stories are not history. They are parables designed to teach their listeners the uniqueness of Jesus that Jesus was even more special than Caesar, who at, at whose birth legend has it, a star appeared in the sky. The writers of the gospel communicated the truth about Jesus through story, because the concept of history would take several hundred y more years to develop. So if we look at the story of the raising of Lazarus, not as history, but as parable, what can we learn about Jesus? 
This perspective frees us from worrying about whether or not it actually happened. The truth in this story doesn't rely on our ability to believe something that is unbelievable. When the anonymous writer of John's Gospel tells the story of Jesus raising Lazarus, he does so to reveal Jesus' true identity as the giver of life, the one in whom we see God, the one who shows people what it means to live in the way of the sacred. Jesus calls Lazarus to come out. In raising Lazarus, Jesus also comes out completely. The raising of Lazarus is an intensely emotional story of anger, despair and sorrow. It follows an account of Jesus being rejected, threatened with stoning and narrowly escaping arrest. Jesus receives news that Lazarus is ill, but delays his visit because he has a point to make. Remember, the writer of John is telling the story not as history, but as parable parable through which the powerful compassion of Jesus will be revealed. Jesus approaches Bethany, the home of his dear friends, sisters Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Still angry at the distortions of his religious tradition, which vested power in priests who exploited and excluded people, angry at the powers of empire that diminished the dignity of the poor and the oppressed. Now Jesus is in anguish at the news of the death of his friend. His grief is genuine. The writer of John's Gospel says, without embellishment, Jesus wept. Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. He has the stone where Lazarus lay dead for four long days removed. Thinking about this story as a parable, I note the interpretation of progressive preacher Dawn Hutchings, who focuses on the etymology of Lazarus's name. There isn't time to go into the detail, but she notes that Lazarus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Eleazar. Eleazar was the renowned successor of Aaron, the first high priest of the people of Israel. This is not an obvious connection for us, but quite possibly it was grasped by a first century audience who understood it as parable. Years of occupation from foreigners and their gods had left the priesthood bound and gagged and defensively hovering in the caves of the dead. Jesus wept over the state of Lazarus and called the priesthood from the dead. Jesus stands outside the tomb, thanks God for what he is about to do, and shouts, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, whose face is bound, forcing him to silence, whose legs and arms are wrapped, keeping him from moving, is liberated from death, rid of his bonds, and set free. So now we are left, 20 centuries later, to reflect on the story as a parable in our time. I believe that Jesus coming out and his call to Lazarus to come out still have great symbolic power. People of minority sexual orientations and gender identities speak of coming out of the closet to tell of the process of being true to who they are and to take their place in the human community. Coming out is a metaphor and a call that can be responded to by all people, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. When people take a stand for justice and for love. Coming out is happening in our city as we emerge from lockdown. Coming out is happening in our church as we prepare to gather again in person. But coming out is not without risk. There were consequences for Jesus' action. In the passage that follows the one that we heard read today, we are told that many became believers, but officials decided that Jesus must die. 
For us, the costs of breaking silence and doing justice, of choosing life and a new way of being in a world that is afflicted by climate change and the ongoing pan pandemic cannot be minimized. Yet when each of us decides to live boldly, we add one more voice to the chorus and make it that much easier for others to find freedom from the pain of their isolation and their fear. Fear is dispelled because we trust in the promise of new life, the rebirth that comes from the divine to the whole earth community. So it is in this spirit that we celebrate the feasts of Halloween, all saints and all souls, as we hear the living and the dead calling us to life. Tonight is Halloween. Tomorrow is the celebration of all saints. And Tuesday, as well as being Melbourne Cup Day, is all souls. Halloween, all saints and all souls are celebrations of the living and the dead, of the mystery of community and connection. They're celebrations of memory and hope. The trinity of days from October the 31st to November the 2nd can be a thin place in the landscape of the year, a reminder of our greater hopes, of the call to name where we have come from, to name who we are and to come out. A thin place, a liminal place, as in Polycaster's poem, this waiting place where we loiter, hover on a tentative cusp, a threshold between the familiar and the unknown. The ancient Celts who celebrated the major festival of Savan around the 1st of November believe that the veil between worlds becomes especially permeable at this time. In something of that spirit, we may find that these days offer an invitation to ponder the past, not with a desire to return to it or second guess it, but with a mindfulness of what has gone before, and perhaps to have a brief visit to the ghosts of what might have been or might still be if we were to come out to life. It's this kind of impulse that gave rise to the feasts of all saints and all souls, recognizing the ancient habit of looking to the past at this time of year, the church created new ways to remember the dead with practices in which we can still hear echoes of ancient celebrations. Though Australians do not do Halloween in a big way, Still the season of All Hallows Eve, All Saints and all, all Souls is available to us as a time of renewal, a time to recall the saints who have traveled with us, to be reminded of our best hopes for a world of community, connection, peace and justice. A time to remember the underside of the history of the church, the resistors and the bearers of hope who are our forebearers in faith. A time to remember the communion of saints, the gathering of spirits, to sustain us when the way grows daunting. What stirs in your memory this season? Who are the people, living or dead, who linger close in these days? Whom do you gather with? Who or what haunts you? How do your memories inspire your path ahead? Today, we are invited to join the throng of humanity traveling together, as in John August Swanson's painting, Festival of Lights. It is an image of coming out in community, grounded in the natural world, somewhere between sunshine and moonlight. Imagine yourself on this pilgrimage, who is walking with you? Who is dancing with you in your life? Remember the living and the dead. And in this liminal space, a poet speaks. We can either hesitate or go forward. 
the gossamer veil of divine nearness flutters ever so lightly, breathing inseparably close as we step to embrace the unrevealed with trust, a shimmering opportunity for connection and listening and being led right on through. Lean into this portal. It is the doorstep to fruitful ground. On our pilgrimage into liminal space is the unseen mystery of divine presence. Where are you in relation to divine presence? Are you journeying in human community with the sacred? You do not have to walk alone. May this week offer you a thin place and a gathering of good spirits. Amen. The prayers of the people in thanksgiving and solidarity. Let us pray. For companions on the journey, we give thanks. For strength and endurance in difficulty. For bedrock beliefs to recall and live by. For shelter in the midst of storms. 
for a community that encourages and challenges our faith, for questions that draw us deeper into life, for answers that act like beacons and guides, for the stories of faithful ones before us, for the faithful story we are weaving together, our legacy to future generations who will seek the holy. For all these things, we give thanks. And we pray for the needs of the world and for our communities as we move to live with both the joy of reduced COVID restrictions and the anxiety of high numbers of cases and incidences of severe illness. We pray for a recovery of community spirit, for the fostering of harmony and an intent of compassion toward all people, especially those who remain vulnerable. We pray for the leaders of our church community and for the leaders of other churches as we prepare to safely reopen our church buildings giving thanks for all who take on the task of ensuring that people are greeted with a warm welcome, even as they go through the procedures of QR codes and vaccination check-in. For people who are not able to return to church because of vaccination status or vulnerability, we pray for assurance that they may know they remain valued and loved members of their faith communities. For the poor whose hunger and struggles for adequate food, clothing and housing hinder their ability to fully participate in society and to contribute to the common good, we pray for economic justice in our society. For people who experience hunger of spirit, we pray that into their emptiness may come abundance of life and solace of the soul. For the grieving ones who carry pain that is hard for others to understand, in their aching times, may there be gentle support and wise kindness. And in a time of silence now, let us pray for particular people and situations known to us for compassion and justice and peace. As we pray for others, may we be moved to put our hopes into action. In the many names of the sacred we pray. Amen. In our offering prayer, we acknowledge and give thanks for the generous giving of people who participate in our online services, supporting the community and outreach of St Michael's and the Mingari Counselling Service. There's information on our website about ways to share your offering if you would like to do that. What we give as our offering is an opportunity to join with the Spirit to make the world a more just and peaceful place. Let us pray together. Good Spirit of life, you call us to be faithful people. In this community, you call us to be people of justice. In this community, you call us to be people of compassion. In this community, you call us to be people of peace. May we know sacred presence as we try to live faithfully in large ways and in small ways, so the kingdom may come in every way. Amen. Honouring the sacred memory of Jesus, we sing to expand the limits of community, making room for those we had not known before. We sing together, walls mark our boundaries.
a blessing for the week ahead. Jesus said to his friends, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is love. The truth is love. Life is love. Walk in love. Follow the way of love, always. And may the God of peace and joy, who is continually making all things new, embrace us as partners in the divine creating, blessing us to be a blessing to all whom we encounter along the way. Amen.